The Phantasmagorium is proud to present Money, Murder, and Minnesota, a retrospective and review of all things Fargo. And here we are again at the end of another great season of television with two Stussies down. How many more will go before we are through? Will Nikki and Wrench make a cute couple? How will Varga meet his end? Does Gloria get justice for Ennis? I'm going to be ambiguous until we get to the... The award-winning Coen Brothers executive produced and Noah Hawley run FX series of Fargo is what we are here for. So let's go. Kat is here. I am Scotty R37. And Steve is a Moscow mule and he is ornery. How you doing, Kat? Good. Excellent. Um, I do. I am really excited to talk about the finale uh, as we have always uh, been excited about when we get to these finales simply because it is sort of the the closing of a chapter uh, which is part of the appeal of the show but before we get to that there has been a little bit of Noah Hawley news that is echoing Timothy all of fantastic really so apparently and this is also something that may put a uh, hindrance on the subsequent seasons of Fargo but Noah Hawley is running the FX show Alien, the Ridley Scott produced Alien television show. And apparently, Timothy Oliphant is reuniting with Noah Hawley. We remember him from season four. Uh, and he's going to be one of the primary characters in the Alien. Uh, I, as yet, I, I, from what I understand, it is untitled. But uh, that is what's going on with Noah Hawley and uh, Timothy Oliphant. Oh. I'm a big Alien fan, and so I had to bring that to the attention of all you other Holly fanatics. Hmm. I just thought it was neat. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we are we are at the end of season three. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for everybody who's taken this journey with us. Uh, there will be spoilers uh, for pretty much the entirety of season three. Uh, I don't think that this can be properly spoiled. If you'd like to watch it, while the recaps are in-depth and insightful and our commentary entertaining and educational, nothing really beats watching it for yourself. And so far, there isn't an episode of Fargo that I would say, skip it. So I would say, even if you're watching the show, go check out, uh, or even if you're watching this show, go check out the one that we are discussing because you're not going to have a bad time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, overall impressions of these two episodes, and when we get to the end, we'll talk about our impressions of the season as a whole, I suppose. I I was surprised at the, the more wanton murder and mayhem that they're willing to embrace in really these last three episodes. Because if they had just done that to begin with, to get rid of Ray and Nikki, then this wasn't wouldn't have snowballed into as much of a problem. Like last week, they literally jackknifed a truck and killed all these inmates and everything. And it's like, this is the same guy who is petrified, afraid of a cop coming into the Stussy Lots building to investigate a, a fender bender. And now he's willing to run the risk of flipping a, a prison bus and killing everybody and hoping that nothing comes of that investigation. <laughs> and uh, the same guy who was willing, initially they were going to kill Nikki and frame Ray. But then when Emmett called and said he killed Ray, they flipped it around. The obvious motive they would have left their police is that, oh, she was just using him to get out of parole and willing to put up with beatings. And then when she found out he got fired, oh, she told him the truth and he got pissed off and killed her. Or vice versa, she told him the truth and got pissed off that she couldn't help her anymore and killed him. Uh, so that was a motive working both ways. But in both scenarios, they would have gladly had them arrested because they're the ones who called to have Nikki go to jail. And it's like, that's a risk because... Even though they, because she knows, you know, Yuri and Mimo are the ones who beat her up. But Varga, of course, has that chuckle, all the surveillance footage. So maybe he's monitoring the police station and knows that the police chief is not going to look into that. Uh, so I was just surprised that given what they do this, these episodes to get Emmett out of trouble, <laughs> that, you know, if you were willing to do that, from that, be that wanton and mayhem from the beginning, you wouldn't have had all these problems with Ray and Nikki <laughs> if you had just killed them. <laughs> like if Yuri and Mimo had just killed her in the parking lot. And nobody, there wouldn't have been a motive. Cy wouldn't have said anything. And you could have just, you know, raised a deadbeat pop belly. You could have given him like a fake drug overdose or whatever, you know, and that would have been finished. So I guess I was just surprised that with episodes eight and nine, that they're just willing, eight, nine, and 10, they've just 
It's like, all bets are off. Nah, we're just going to throw caution to the wind and start being like mass killers. <laughs> it's like, uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting how they, that shift from being so cautious to suddenly, oh yeah, now the gloves are off and we're going to just go on a killing spree. Well, and it, I think it may have something to do with desperation and that there's still a role that Emmett has to fill. And one of the best things about Varga and Mimo and Yuri is that they are using intimidation and just like the sort of Damocles to bring things down. And when you find out what they're capable of, then, then the callow weaklings that are under their thumbs, essentially, they, they're they terrified into whatever action is going to be done. Now, Sai's been dispatched. Um, we don't yeah, get to see Sai. So they had to get rid of him. Right. And so it it is now, and that... The manipulation of Psy was directly leading to the manipulation of, of uh, Emmett. So I do, I understand that it does ramp up very quickly. However, I I feel like now it's the desperation of everyone involved to ensure that the plan will come to fruition as we find out with the widow. Yes, who I believe is the, the primary antagonist of the season. Uh, yes, a surprise. Varga is really not... Varga's not the primary. She's like she's the primary antagonist, and we'll get that to that in a minute. Uh, so this episode begins with. Oh wait, before before we begin, I do want to say hello to the chat. Yes. Uh, we do have the Phantom Organist. I'm here. So are we. Thank you. Are we really? We might not. But be. that's the thing. <laughs> are we really? We might are not. Are we really be. here? Is that a story? <laughs> it's a true story. Mm -hmm. And uh, Phantom Organist says, yes, I'm here to haunt you. And uh, that we say, I'm assuming this is Steve pushing buttons in the background. That's me. <laughs> is it you? Yes, it's me. <laughs> is that a true story? Uh, or is it just a story? Yes. Uh, lemon Pie is here. Hey, Lemon. Yes, Ace is Lemon Pie. And we remember that you did mention a couple weeks ago that there was something you wanted to tell us about why this season was not your favorite and that you will tell us at the end of the of this, uh, once we finish the spoiler recap, we will go into that. I'm pretty sure it was you that said that, uh, and not Edge of Time. We'll see. Uh, DJ Playnice is here. Hey, DJ, saying hello to me and you and everyone here at the Phantasmagorium. Thank you so much. Nice to see Tim. He is not on my left this time, but Truck Lives Matter. Truck it's lives a true story. <laughs> it's true. And, uh, but yeah, it's great to see everybody. Uh, and yeah, Lemon, please, please let us know your thoughts uh, on this season as a finale. And yeah, I'd like to hear, but you, you, as, as I in, so rudely interrupted Kat, you were going to uh, begin us off. Yes. Yeah, so uh, where we left off is that Emmett has apparently been haunted by what he believes is the ghost of Ray when it's most likely just Nikki uh, playing on his guilty conscience by you know leaving his car outside the hospital and decorating his office with all the stamps and shaving off his mustache, <laughs> shaving off his mustache or whatnot. And so now uh, he's turned himself in and he tells Gloria that, yeah, I killed my brother. And he feels really bad about it. And he admits that he actually did trick Ray out of the stamp. It wasn't just Ray being a jerk, it was true. And he's like, yeah, I, I wanted the stamps and it's like, yeah, that's a bad thing, but at the same time, I picture that if Ray had gotten the ten thousand dollars that the stamp was worth, he would have probably blown it all in on a car anyway. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't picture like Emmett seems like a guy who's yes, he's an idiot, but he's a little bit more on the level than Ray. Uh, so he confesses that he screwed over the brother, and he says he's been treating him like crap his whole life, and now he's just finally dead, and now he feels bad about it and is trying to confess. But uh, this is complicated by the fact that. Elsewheres in Minnesota, we see two men, one named Marvin Stussy, killed with glass shards, uh, slicing his throat, by, killed by Mimo, mimicking the murder of Ray Stussy. Another, a man named George Stussy, killed in the same manner the glorious stepfather was, mouth and nose super glued shut, sitting in front of an open freezer. And Mo Damick goes to investigate, and he's smart enough to put the pieces together, and he thinks that Ah, so Gloria wasn't entirely wrong about it being conspiracy. She must have just been wrong about who was doing it. And they quickly find the assailant because there was a witness, a guy dressed like Mimo, and 
His name is Donald Wu, and apparently his mother's boyfriend was named Stussy and used to tittle him in the closet. And uh, he's a just got out of jail six months ago after serving 22 and a half years for beating a guy's head in with a tire iron. And Gloria surmises that he must have been paid off or something. Uh, they never really explain what, but okay. So <laughs> Varga has found somebody willing to take the fall. And Mo Damick says, oh, well, you know, Ray or uh, Emmett confessing, that's just him being guilty, a guilty complex. Let him go. And that's an order. And so they have to let Emmett go. And Gloria's like, just tell me who it is. Like, who's the puppet master behind this? The guy I saw, the, the guy I saw at your place, the guy selling lady shoes. It's him, isn't it? And he nods and he says yes, but he doesn't go into it. And again, Emmett has an opportunity to try and get himself out from under this, but he chooses not to, and as he leaves, Varga has pulled up with Mimo, and Emmett gets in the car, and Mimo just gives this evil, like, ha-ha, we won type look to Gloria, and when, and then it cuts to inside the car, and Varga tells Emmett, the problem is not that there is evil in the world, but that there is good, because otherwise no one would care, <laughs> as they drive away, and it's like, Emmett, why did you get back in the car? <laughs> But where's he going to go? Well, like I said, he could tell Gloria, this is what happened. Like, lay his cards on the table. We took money from a guy two years ago. We didn't do our due diligence. We think he implied he killed our lawyer, but we can't prove it. And he's been taken up office in the in our offices with a padlock door. We don't know what's going on in there. It's been going on for months. And when the IRS came to pay us a visit to audit our books, he's like, oh, we'll just show him the fake ones then. So clearly there's something going on. And, and he, he, but he doesn't, he, once again, he, like, just like when he killed Ray and he could have done the right thing and said he calls Varga. Well, now, once again, he's, like, he even told Gloria when he walked in there, if somebody comes here pretending to be my lawyer, don't let him in. So it's like he's committed to not caving into Varga anymore, but he ends up doing that anyway as on his way out, even though Gloria gives him the opportunity. He's like, look, I can't arrest you for the murder, but tell me who it is. Just tell me. Yeah. And he doesn't. He just leaves again. You know, he... Well, but it's also, like, once he finds out that there are two other people who are dead, like, he's still in fear of his life. Yeah, but it's, wouldn't it be reasonable that he's safer at the at the precinct than going back home? Well, yes. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you there. It's yeah. just a matter of, like, if Varga and all of the accomplices can manipulate law enforcement to the point where even if he shows up and tells the truth, he's still released. Like, he is becoming more powerful than he wants because it's not his power. He's a pawn. People think that he's the powerful one, but he's not. So yeah. I still think it's, like, fear. I still think that he's reacting out of fear. And if they can change things around, then they can they can certainly orchestrate his death within prison as well. Okay. Um so then Gloria brings in Ruby Goldfarb to question her again about Emmett's timeline that he provided the night that he killed Ray. And she's like, well, and she's nice enough to come down to the station. She's all dressed up, all foo-fooey and stuff. And she's like, uh, well, memories fade after a while. And she covers for Emmett again. But then she says, well, he was only there. With, he arrived with Cy at five minutes. She's like, well, you told the officers the first time that he didn't arrive till 30 minutes later. Oh, well, like I said, memories fade. And, oh, if you have any more questions, just, uh, you know, at, send them to my attorney. Because she's sitting in Gloria's office when Gloria sees that this Donald Wu guy has been arrested. And so Gloria's just kind of at a loss and Ruby leaves. And because Gloria doesn't really know this is all part of a financial conspiracy, she's still trying to figure out what all this. She still thinks this is a feud between the brothers, so she can't figure out what's going on. Uh, and meanwhile, in other parts of town... We find out what's been going on with uh, Nikki and Mr. Wrench for the last three months. Aside from taunting Emmett, she has since learned ASL so she can communicate with Mr. Wrench. And as Varga is ordering his Mimo to move his truck to a new location, they get to an intersection and Mr. Wrench rushes out and provides cover fire with a machine gun while Nikki takes a grenade and chucks it into the, into the truck Mimo and his accomplice jump out, flee for their lives, and then Nikki and Wrench just jump in the truck and drive off. She tosses the grenade out the window, and it's just a paperweight. Much like one I have downstairs, actually. Nice. Uh, and uh, Mimo can't believe it, and he 
goes to see Varga back at Stussy Lots as Varga's getting a call from Nikki. And Varga's kind of being callous. Oh, look, it's our recidivist on the phone. And when he sees Mimo show up all like, you know, just covered in ash and, and soot, he realizes that, oh, she's got the truck. And then she starts listing off the the, can, the uh, account numbers to Varga because she and Mr. Wrench have stolen all the financial information from the back of the truck and left it abandoned in a lot in a like a gravel uh like some uh quarry or something oh, like a wreck or a wreck yard or something a wreck yard yeah like a junkyard and he's like she's listing off the serial numbers for all his accounts uh, swiss bank accounts cayman island accounts and he's like you know that's not you know to steal from someone you don't know is just lazy <laughs> and she says well i've still got all this he's like well you need a password and and six sides at security questions and his attitude is like, she doesn't really seem to know what she's doing. And she's like, well, meet me at the hotel, uh, Clarant in, uh, at four o'clock. And so he comes there and he's sitting down and she thinks she's, ha ha, I've got you. You can't really try anything. He's like, are you sure about that? And she looks around and he's sta like put all the, a bunch of people who look just like him and are dressed exactly the same throughout the lobby. And we see that Mimo has a, a gun trained on her until Mr. Wrench uh, walks up behind him and puts the gun to his head. And Varga's like, ah, you've just added another zero to your income as he's trying to offer to, to buy her out. And she's like, look, I know that suitcase you brought is probably, or that briefcase is probably just full of your dirty underwear. There's no money in there. And and like, well, I work for an R wall. But no, you don't. You just say you do because you want, you know, people look past middle management. You're a boss. I know one when I see one. He's like, ah, you've just added another zero to your, <laughs> another zero to your account. And I can't tell, like he might be, be serious about trying to hire her, maybe not, but he does try and get her to drink the tea that he has with him, which most certainly is poisoned, and yeah. she won't do that either, and she just decides not to play his games. She's like, nope, you're going to meet us tomorrow with the money, and I'm going to set the terms, and goodbye. And she gets up to leave, and Mr. Wrench walks by and just gives Varga the look. And surprisingly, Mimo, uh, he didn't kill Mimo. He let him live, and they walk yeah. off. I was surprised by that too. I because when because it is uh, they show that Nikki has like an earwig, yeah, and uh, Wrench has the walkie-talkie, but they didn't show what happened. I thought that the sound would have been a gunshot to signify mm -hmm. we're clear. So I, but that did, obviously that did not happen, right? Because I assume also that in the three months that she's been hanging out with Mister Wrench, that she's told him the whole story. And then he probably knows that this is the guy who, who beat her up and uh, or the other guy who did it. And you can see that he's really angry when he had the gun to Mimo's head, almost like it was personal or something. But he let him go. So I was kind of surprised by that. Uh, so meanwhile, Emmett shows up back at home and the security team, which he hired because he insisted they needed more security when he thought he was being like ghosted or haunted. Uh, there's all these mercenary guys. It's just funny. They're all hanging around this guy's house, which is empty because it's just Varga, Mimo and Emmett living there now. And Emmett is signing all these documents one after another. And Varga's like, yes, that's it. We're almost finished. And once he signs the last one, he's like, oh, he's like, I'm tired. He's like, yes, that's perfectly natural. And just like in the wild, when the weaker animal goes limp in the predator's jaws, there's an instinct where food knows it's food. And I'm like, oh my God, this is how much he has Emmett that he could be as blatant as possible. But he may have overstepped his boundaries a little bit because – Emmett is now at the point where he's not going to take this anymore. So as Varga gets the call from Nikki telling him where we're going to meet and where you're going to bring my money, uh, Emmett snatches Mimo's gun from him, holds Varga at gunpoint, and he finally reasons that, no, there's no mongrel hordes. There's no peasants with tor torches and pitchforks. It's you. <laughs> and he's like, uh, and then Varga again. It's like Emmett has finally stood up to him, but Varga talks him into believing that the gun is a, a fingerprint authentication required. And, Oh, just check and see, you know, like the gun James Bond has in Skyfall, that it won't fire if somebody else tries to use it. And like an idiot, Emmett tries to check it just as uh, Mimo sneaking up behind him with a fire poker. And Varga sprays Emmett in the eyes with his mouth, with his uh, like mouth spray. spray. Yeah. And then uh, Mimo strikes, strikes Emmett in the head. And he's like, that's it. We're done here. Clean up everything. Wipe everything down. We were never here. And they leave. And and Vimo's like, oh, I'm surprised she actually called us. And he's like, yeah, well, we've got a stop to make. So they go to this other side of industrial part of town. And, and that's the thing I thought was interesting, too. I mean, did, I thought he would have killed Emmett because now that Emmett has signed all the documents, there doesn't seem to be much of a reason to leave him alive. And it's like, 
he's another witness who, I mean, even though he doesn't know Varga's real name, he knows, you know, a lot about him in terms of his mannerisms, his appearance. And yet Varga lets him live. And I thought it's like, you went to the trouble of jackknifing a prison bus and massacring everybody there just to get Nikki who knew next to nothing about your conspiracy. Emmett reasonably knows a lot more about it. And yet you let him live. It's like, I didn't really understand that logic either. Well, well I, 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 I'm, I'm going to have gonna to say that I think that it is uh, the necessity of signing the documents. And then he ultimately does have to uh, 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 admit bankruptcy. Like he has to file. Are we back? Yeah. Okay, good. I think so. Sorry yeah. about that, folks. <laughs> He has to file Chapter 11. There's an order of operations that has to be followed. Yeah, I that, guess. That was my perception. Right. Ruby's probably there. Because I figured he would have come back to get Emmett at some point once he finishes the task. But he doesn't. So anyway, that's true. Because that's right. So Var Varga and the crew go to meet Nikki. And they're driving down this road in an industrial part of town. This little kid walks up to and knocks on the window. And Varga unrolls it. And he's like, Vamanos. He's like, the Swango. Because Varga has started calling Nikki the Swango, which the fans all started calling her as well. And they get out of the car. They follow the kid. He's got all these military guys. Because he even told Nikki, I'm bringing a fire team with me, just so you know. And why he would tell her that, I don't know, but okay. So they go into this little room that has two elevators. written Spray painted on the floor, it says leave the money in locker three, or the drive is in locker 327. Bring the money there. And they take the elevators up and Varga decides to hold the elevator to make sure it's open when they get there. While Mimo and the others start creeping down the hall ever so slowly, they get into the locker 327, which is open. And there's a card table sitting there and there's just a piece of paper on it. that says, leave the money here. The drives are in locker 209. And Mimo turns around to tell this to Varga. And just then Varga gets a call or a text message from a mysterious person that says, the IRS has the drives, get out. And then the elevator door across from him opens and we see Mr. Wrench starting to come out as Varga closes the elevator door very quickly and Mimo rushes to get in and the doors are closing just as Mimo is looking at him and Varga's looking at him like legit terrified. The doors close and then we hear Mr. Wrench just go to town. Uh, yes. Killing all these guys. We then see outside, the henchmen who stayed outside are also dead, killed by Nikki. And she's waiting there with a shotgun for Varga. Varga, meanwhile, is terrified in the elevator. The first, the second time we've seen him truly afraid. The first time was when the IRS agent showed up. The second time now is when Nikki, when he's coming down the elevator, knowing that this is now a trap. And the doors open, and Nikki finds that Varga's coat has been left behind, his raincoat. But he's gone, and he's scurried out through the roof. And she and Mr. Wrench have no recourse to follow him. And so, which they could have, but they decide not to. And so she leaves Mr. Wrench with the $2 million ransom, which Varga did bring this time. And she only takes two bundles of cash. And, Var and Wrench is like, what are you doing? I mean, we're going to split this. And she's like, no, all I want is the brother. You take it. And then they part ways. Uh, <laughs> what did you think about this whole <laughs> ambush? I, I liked, I liked it. Um, I thought it was a. I thought it was very conniving. I thought it spoke very well to not only uh, Nikki but also the team that her and Wrench had developed. Because this seems like something that would be out of a a, a Wrench and uh, Adam Goldberg uh, playbook. Like yeah. that would have been something that they would have done to try and ambush a potential uh, prey. Um, I thought it was great. I thought that the uh, relationship, like the development of sign language and how Nikki and Wrench were sort of working together, uh, it does culminate in the in the you know the final moments of Emmett. Uh, I think it's. I thought it was. I thought it was great. I thought it was a great a little tense action scene to see what was going to happen. And again, in in classic Fargo style. Uh, it was something that wasn't necessarily seen on screen, but it was better left to the imagination and the tension was still very real. Yeah, I thought it was pretty good.
Especially mm. uh, because I was wondering, like, are they going to pull some supernatural shit to get him out of the elevator or like what's going to happen? And some viewers thought he left all of his clothes behind, almost like he's the man with no clothes, like the empty salesman type guy, but he, which kind of he is, but it, he just left his coat behind and he got away. It's like, okay, that's interesting. Cause he certainly doesn't seem like the athletic type to be able to scurry away. But you know, so maybe there is some type of, you know, wolf in sheep's clothing aspect to it that the wolf just disappeared. Um, well, quick escapes is sort of a, uh, that is something that this, show is known for many of the characters they just get away yes so we've seen meanwhile that uh nikki has had already sent all the irs information to larue dollard uh it's not known why she knows that larue dollard happened to be the guy who was auditing stussy lots earlier it's just that she leaves sends sends the information specifically to him and he, he shows up to work and he sees the the paper sitting there and he opens it and he sees that oh, it's a sussy lots financial information. Hey, Eric 130. Hey, and so he starts going through it. Meanwhile, back at the station, uh, Gloria is tendering her resignation because she's like, this is just ridiculous. The, 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 the stupidity and the, I, I'm just like, I'm done. And right as she hands in her letter of resignation, she gets a phone call from LaRue Dollard because apparently her Gloria's phone number, which she had given Nikki has was written down amongst the documents and he thinks Gloria sent him all of this. And she's like, well, I didn't send you anything, but I'll come down and see what this is. It's like, what is this about? And he says, are you investigating a case involving Emmett Stussy? He's like, well, we were, but that case is closed. How about Stussy lots? And she's like, huh? He's like, well, I'm investigating inf uh, evidence of a vast financial conspiracy involving tax fraud and, and banking loans and lining their pockets. The partners lining their pockets with $200 million. It's like, uh, I'll be right there. So she shows up and we see that he has taken over this boardroom at the IRS that has all of the papers laid out uh, chronologically, basically. And he bits, puts it to her this way. She's like, is this money laundering? He says, no, it's not. And a lot of fans That's what I thought at first. Websites falsely state that it's money laundering and it isn't. He points to this one piece of paper and he says, 18 months ago, Stussy Lots was a normal company. They owned 24 garages and parking lots. And then they took on a $2 million, a million dollar loan from this company called Narwhal. It had a corporate ID, but it's a fake one. And a, 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 four months ago, this or th four months ago, this new partner they signed corporate documents to bring on named VM Varga. From then on, they've been cooking the books to make the company look a lot more successful than it is, increasing their line of credit, taking out loans, pocketing the money for all the all the partners, and just it, they've taken two hundred million. And they've also apparently spent some of the money to buy legitimate properties because, like Varga told them, at once we got to sell the shopping mall and stuff like that. And she's like, and he, I wish he would go more into the specifics because it's almost like the writers don't think the, fa the fans are interested. But like a lot of people to this day are kind of curious exactly what he did or how he got away with it. But because well, my understanding is that you would have to spend some of the money legitimately to make it because otherwise the bank's not going to give you another loan if it doesn't look like you spent, you know, did something with it. If you just put it in an offshore account. Sure. Well, you need it. And apparently they have been buying things, but he doesn't really go into it much. And he says that this is legal because it's like a similar to a leveraged buyout, which companies do. And he says it's perfectly legal as long as you pay your taxes. Yeah. True. Except in this case, companies which do leveraged buyouts don't put money in offshore accounts and just because this is basically stealing. They're just taking loans to that they're prepping up their company to make it look big, tying it to other fictional shell companies that he set up, and then just stuff stuffing the loans in these dozens of offshore accounts in different countries. And apparently spending some of the money to acquire legitimate businesses, but that when he says that's legal, it's like that's not really how leverage bleed out. Like if a company actually did that for real, that's not really legal. Uh, but I think that it's it's one of those situations that sort of fits with the tone of the this season in terms of this is a true story, but it doesn't matter because the facts of the matter don't matter. Like the truth doesn't matter so long as everything lines up properly. And the problem with the IRS is like, well, this is this doesn't sound legal. And then and Dollard is so happy. And he's like, oh, actually, it really, really is. This is something that happens all the time. Um, you just have to do it properly so that yet another layer of people who are in control, who can lie, will get their piece of the pie. Like right. there is something nefarious about it. And Dollard being an agent of the American government through internal revenue is like, oh, no, this happens all the time and it's fine. 
we're okay with it, but you have to pay your taxes. And it's just like, okay, everybody is ripping off everybody. And it just sounds so far ago. It's like not even the American government is free and clear in well, in these stories. I, I got the impression that Dollard was also excited to take this guy down as well. For like, sure. Because uh, here's the thing. Uh, if you take that kind of, that amount of money, like then two hundred million is missing, but they made three hundred million on the scam because they did acquire some legitimate businesses that they sold. Uh, but you have to be able to pay back the money somehow, uh, otherwise, you know. You, yes, you declare Chapter Eleven and thing and, and things go away. But if they knew what he was doing to begin with, they would never have given him the loans to begin with. So in that way, it's fraudulent because you obtain the loan fraudulently. Uh, so it's kind of interesting. That's why I wanted him to go more into it and to explain it a lot more. But um, hey, but Eugene was, Bird. So he basically been stealing all this money from the company, and that's when Gloria, Gloria gets the phone call about the shootout at the uh, in the industrial park, and she goes there, and we see that Mimo is dead. He's being carried away by the coroner, and they see security footage showing that Nikki and Mr. Wrench are involved, but she doesn't know who Mr. Wrench is, and then Nikki, they figure, oh, they. That she re uh, Gloria is smart enough to reason that Nikki will want revenge on Emmett for Ray's death, and so she's like, "We gotta warn Ray, telling Winnie Lopez we gotta or gotta warn Emmett because uh, you know she's coming for him." Uh, to that end, we. Um, I'm gonna get to your review, Lemon, because I did. I think I think it's fascinating. I've got the marked, and we'll get to that when we get to the end because I enjoy your voice. In I do think this is all exciting. Yeah, bankruptcy, taxes, parking lots, insurance, loan, exciting Fargo stuff. I say yes. This is very exciting. This is my one of my favorite seasons of the show because I love how he, the way he's just been manipulating Emmett and the way this scam has been working is so fun. So uh, it's Emmett taking goes, the mundanity and turning it into crime. That's yeah, why. Yeah, and it's fun. And, it's, fun. and uh, <laughs> it's ridiculous. So Emmett wakes up back at his house and the stamp in a bit of trolling, uh, they've left the stamp on his forehead and, uh, he gets his coat and he rushes down to Stussy lots to find that it has been taken over by Ruby Goldfarb. And she's like, Oh, thank you so much for, uh, selling your company to me for a hundred thousand dollars or your company's assets, uh, for a hundred thousand dollars. It was very generous of you, but Emmett, uh, you need to declare chapter 11, but because your, your company is now saddled with $300 million in debt. Right, but she it. says, don't worry because you have millions in offshore accounts. And then she summons security to kick him out of the building. So what I took from this is that Emmett has it the wrong way around. He accuses her of working for Varga. I think she hired Varga because like she said to Emmett, I don't want to enter competition with you by buying some of your lots. She wanted all of it. No, it's just not going to work. I did two cents. Yeah, two cents. <laughs> She wanted the company's assets for dirt cheap, so she hired Varga, probably gave him the money to invest in the company. His form of payment would be the scam, and she doesn't care about getting the hundreds of millions because she just wants all the assets. She's rich anyway, and he just absconds with his cut of the money. And so she is the primary antagonist of the season, and Fargo breaks its rules again because she is the villain, and she gets away with it, and she doesn't get her comeuppance at all, which she should have which is breaking a Coen Brothers rule because seeming all the time the bad guys get punished and she just gets away scot-free. Mm -hmm. So that was a, and I, cause I knew there was something about the Goldfarb character. Cause it's like, Oh, you just happen to have this person who wants to buy your company or merge or whatever. Who's been on the side the whole time. And I kind of figured it out when she showed up for the dinner and wasn't really that troubled by, you know, what was all the shenanigans that were going on? And she got the phone call from the, whoever it was. And she's like, oh, no, the cops are here now. And it's like, okay, so she's in on it. But this is what she wanted. It was like a corporate takeover, Gordon Gekko style thing. But I don't want to pay a lot of money for it. So let's find somebody else to do all the shady shit to assume all the risk and, uh, and you know, pull it off. Well, it's just interesting because that, like, the Widow Gold Goldfarb has been uh, referenced since the beginning. Yeah. Uh, of, of the season and that it was always a concern and it was always an interest of hers to acquire Stussy lots. And I like how it all came around that the initial million dollars came from her and it was like, okay, now's the time to strike. 
And it is just sort of kismet and happenstance that it coincides with the escalation of the feud between Ray and Emmett. Like, just the, the you, stars aligned kind of thing. Yeah, it was kind of a, you know, the perfect crime <laughs> in a way. Well, uh, it wasn't a crime. That's the best part. Oh, I, I don't know. The way he explains it, though, when he says, oh, yeah, just because someone does it all the time doesn't mean it isn't illegal. I mean, if I were to prep up my finances or whatever and lie and say I'm worth this amount of mo X amount of dollars, like a million, and I'm only worth, say, 50000 50, and I use that to get a loan and, saying, and then I pocket the money and don't pay – aside from not paying taxes, I don't pay back any of the money that I've taken, then that doesn't seem legal. I mean, I, I know how leverage bleed outs typically, or leverage you know, bust outs, whatever you call them, typically work, but mm. uh, it, it's, yes, it's legal if you, you pay your taxes on it when you buy a company and strip mine it for profit. Uh, again, like we saw in uh, Wall Street by when Gordon Gecko does that, but he wasn't taking a bunch of loans from the bank and not paying them back. That's kind of what Varga's doing. Uh, cause they, 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 cause remember they said that there's $200 million of unaccounted money, but 300 million in debt for the company. So it's, that's why I really wanted him to go into it. Cause I found that really interesting and they just kind of, Oh no, you're not interested in this. Let's move on over here. You know, kind of like Fargo pushing you out of the room. Oh no, don't pay attention to the, the man behind the curtain pulling the strings. <laughs> Agre uh, well, and two things like at this point, I think that we are still, we're, we're wa witnessing the crime and the mundane accounting that ultimately brings down Emmett and Stussy Lodz. And the primary, like, it, it's a heightened uh, example of the same ending to Fargo the movie. And it's like, I just don't understand. All for just a bit of money? Like, all of these people are dead. And for what? Just a bit of money. And so, like, seeing that and seeing how even the people who are involved in that bit of money include the government which i thought was ominous but also entertaining like it was like oh okay yeah there's death and taxes like there there are your two constants in the universe the other thing was is that it reminded me especially in that boardroom that dollard was in have you ever seen the ben affleck movie the uh, the accountant way better example of mathematically deciding how things work within a company and even that one dumbs it down to a gunfight at the end just because we don't want to get caught up in the in in the accounting of it yeah because i, I just looked at it from the perspective that this okay he, he's rich but it's still parking lots. 24 parking lots are not going to get you a 300 million, 200 million in loans from the bank. Like they clearly, like Yvarga says, I, even if I gave the IRS all the account numbers for all these shell companies I've set up, there's no way they can unravel this conspiracy, which is why I love that LaRue Dollar did unravel the conspiracy, perhaps spurred on by the fact that he could tell something was off when they kicked him out of the office the first time. And he's like, no, I'm going to get these bastards. <laughs> so... Well, and that character is fantastic because he is shown to be meticulous in every aspect, from even the way that he hangs up his coat and purposefully drapes his scarf over the over the coat rack. Like, everything about him is meticulous. Yeah. So, uh, meanwhile, we catch up with Emmett. He's driving down the road, and the car suddenly breaks down. He gets out to try and call like AAA or something and the phone, no service. And he gets upset and he smashes the phone and destroys it. And then Nikki shows up in a pickup truck with a shotgun. And As you do. he mistakenly, in a, a move which I thought really dumbs down the character a bit. You know, uh, Paul Moraine wanted her to give that speech to the evil. The evil was Varga. He is the villain. He is the wolf. And she's even smart enough to say that. She's like, man, she, man, Emmett, that, that Varga fellow plucked you like a spring chicken. <laughs> and it's she seems to think that just because she's turned over the drives to the IRS and that she's killed his henchmen that, oh, I've won. 
but it, you really haven't because Emmett, he's a hapless idiot, but he's not like super villainy material for her to be reciting uh, Obadiah 11, uh, that Bible verse, and yet she's doing it anyway. Oh, thou exalt thyself like the eagle, thy kingdom come, and all this stuff. And Emmett's like, what? And so I'm listening to her do this, and I'm like, no, it's not Emmett. It's like she's smart enough to even say that Varga is the one doing this, but like you need to be saying this to Varga. You need to be going to find him, not Emmett. And uh, I don't know. It just, it, given what happens immediately after, I just thought, ah. Uh. Well, so I didn't think that Nikki was going to make it. I didn't think Emmett was going to make it. And Nikki obviously blames Emmett for the death of Ray. And I thought that that was, Emmett was going to get his comeuppance, but I thought it was strange that Nikki was going to do it because it was the perception of Nikki that Emmett was the guilty party. And right. so she was going to kill Emmett. And then something was going to bite her in the ass for killing the wrong guy. Yeah, because I don't think Emmett killed Ray. I think that it was stupidity and happenstance that occurs within the Stussy family. But yeah. I thought that she was going to get busted or she was going to get her comeuppance because she did wrong. And even though she felt justified. Right. And in the spirit of uh, Peter and the wolf, the cat came to eat the bird. Yes. And, uh, but that doesn't, um, happen because a state trooper happens along and he's like, Hey guys, this is in a parking lot. You got to get moving. And Emmett gets back in the car. She sets the shotgun on the back of the, the rear bed of his, tr of his car. And because the state, because her pickup truck is parked directly behind it, the state trooper didn't see that she had a gun there and he's talking to him and they're going to leave or whatever. And then Emmett suddenly gets frustrated. He's like, and the cop orders him out of the car. He's like, she's got a gun. You should get her. And, and then it kind of escalates. And she just keeps walking back towards the back of the car. And then once Emmett says, hey, man, you should shoot her. She's the one who's got the gun. That's when she whips out the shotgun. And she and the state trooper kill each other. Bam. And I thought, you know, if, I mean, she could have, I mean, I get it that she's worried that Emmett might rat her out. Hey, this lady came to kill me. But since he didn't say anything to that effect until the, the only reason he ends up saying that is because she keeps moving closer to the gun. Whereas if she had stayed like walked back towards her car and pretended to start it, I think Emmett wouldn't have said anything because Emmett again is feeling really guilty because she's like, Oh, what do you have to say for yourself? And he's like, well, you know, I don't think I can say, you say I can't sink any lower, but maybe yesterday I would have thought I couldn't sink any lower than that. So he didn't care really if she was going to kill him or not, but only when the state she trooper, he recorded it. Yeah, and so now that the state trooper has shown up to aggravate the situation, uh, she just kind of falls for it, and they kill each other. And I thought, why did you kill the state? Like, there was no reason for Nikki to escalate this to killing the guy. She could have just said, okay, and gone back into the... She could have, like, literally walked behind Emmett's car, grabbed the shotgun, opened the passenger side door of her truck, and set it down, and then scooted across, you know, the bench seats and... No. Another day. It's like she didn't. I mean, she just. I didn't buy that she would do that. Like she would just get the gun and kill the state trooper for no real reason. It's like you could just get Emmett another day. It's like it's not the end of the world. But well, all right. So I think it speaks to her character, uh, and her anger, uh, in terms of when the state trooper pulls over. She's being amicable, and it's like, oh, that's mighty Christian of you for, for pulling over and trying to help. She's Neither one of them are thinking on their feet very much. I'm pretty sure Emmett is just defeated at this point. He's already requested that he be shot in the chest with a shotgun. And then she's like, I'm just going to go and get my license. And he's like, no, you stay there. What's going on? Someone say, what's going on? And all they had to say was, my car broke down. I called her. That's that's how we got it. You're probably wondering how I got here. And that's how it goes. Her going for the gun, I don't think she would have made it around to the passenger side. The cop wouldn't have allowed it. I think she also thought she was going to get away with it because she is, oh, just a pretty bitty. Like, she's hot. 
And I thought that she was going to smile sweet. She thought that she was going to smile sweetly and be able to walk away from the situation. But when you're going to have to get out of the car, then there's more explanations as to what's going on. That's when things had to escalate. And I honest, I, I think it's a matter of she, it was the last thing that she had to do. It was the last thing she wanted to do. And she's gotten out of a, you know, a bus roll. <laughs> so I think that she right. was, <laughs> and after, after she had had that interaction with Malvain and having recited her version of Ezekiel 25, 17, she <laughs> thought she was, she was going to get her done. And sadly, that's yeah. not how it works in a Coen Brothers universe. That's how it works in a Tarantino universe. Yes, she was impatient and short-sighted and so dead. Like She just listened to him and got back in the car and driven off. Because Emmett requested to be shot, he wouldn't have said anything about the gun probably. And then she could have just, you know, got him another day. But she was just too hyped up. It's like, this is it. And now she's dead. And yeah. in a very Fargo-esque supernatural twist. No sooner that these two have killed each other, Emmett's car magically starts back up again when he gets in and he's able to drive away. <laughs> I had an idea about that as well. Yeah. Now, I don't know how it goes in 2010, 2011, pardon me. Yeah. I thought that there was some sort of electronic computer manipulation to be able to shut it down like an OnStar kind of thing. Where you can actually, if you, oh, my car's been stolen. And it's like, okay, we're shutting it down remotely kind of thing. I was wondering if there was something along those lines. Um, because they do make a point of when the truck pulls up behind Emmett's SUV. It's like you hear the the, the engine block sort of cooling down. You hear the tink, 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 tink. And so I thought it was like, oh, you got a big fancy car. You think that gets you anywhere? Actually, it fucks you over more than you thought. And her showing up in an admittedly older model, I thought that that's how it happened. Mm. But I think that that is too much of a headcanon. I think that that is too much of me trying to make it work than anything that was presented on screen. I almost presented, looked at that as like, again, the weird Coen brothers karma. You're a bad person. You were going to get caught whether you want to or not, mm. which is why I'm surprised that Ruby Goldfarb got away scot-free. And so Emmett drives off and with nothing left, he goes back to his wife who's living in another state. It looks like, and uh, he just collapses at her feet and she's surprised to see him there. And he grafts her legs and just starts crying. And the camera pans over to the side and says, five years later, we're now in 2016. She has taken him yeah. back. They're a happy family again. Sai is there and he's in a wheelchair. He can, he's paralyzed, but he can kind of talk um, a little bit. And Emmett says, how are you doing friend? And she, and he says, good as new. Good as new. And it's like, okay. And it, the text on the screen says that Emmett Stussy filed chapter 11 bankruptcy. He pled guilty to tax fraud only Got two years probation, which again is an American legal system prioritizing the rich people. Oh yeah, guy guy pulls a scam to rob the the banks of two hundred million dollars and no jail time. <laughs> it's like okay, um, and so it also says that it is believed but can't be proven that he holds twenty million in offshore accounts. And I was surprised by that because I didn't think Vargo was going to leave him anything. It's like what's his incentive to leave? Because Emmett has been so dumb to go along with everything Vargo wanted that it's like. Varga could tell that Emmett's not the kind of guy who's greedy, who's going to keep quiet just because you leave him some money. So I'm surprised that Varga left him with anything. I think that that was an attempt at the, the incentive to do so. I think that that was also possibly the, the conscience of uh, the widow Goldfarb because she even says when, when he goes into the, yeah, into the 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 uh, office, it's like you sold off the company. The company's mine. You have like with, for a hundred thousand dollars. That's very generous of you. You've been able to make your money. File Chapter Eleven, but you will have money. You will be taken care of. And it almost it, it looked like an absolution on Goldfarb, the widow Goldfarb's uh, end of it. 
Sure, I did a bad thing by taking this guy's company and making it as a part of mine. And aiding and abetting like a murderous conspiracy. <laughs> and aiding and abetting a murderous conspiracy. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because that's the thing. I, I would have thought that you're right. That's why Varga doesn't kill Emmett the first time. Because he needs him to file chapter. Which technically he doesn't need him to file chapter 11. Because it's like. Like he already sold the company to her. Or sold the assets to her for $100,000. It's done. So. I mean, okay. So he filed chapter 11, whatever. And I'm surprised that Varga didn't then come back to kill. You know, just to kill Emmett. To make sure, you know, tie up the loose end. Uh, but he doesn't. And so. Maybe that was the Widow Goldfarb's request to leave Emmett alive. He's too much of a hapless idiot to do to, to turn you in for anything anyway, maybe. Uh, well, let's go back. Let's go back to the beginning. Yeah. No one was going to die at the hand of Emmett. No one was going to die. The the lawyer the lawyer had was to die. Probably the only person who had to die. That would have shaken both Cy and Emmett to the core. Yeah. Which it did. But it was right. all, it was the machinations of Ray and Nikki that made everything build. Which is part of the reason, and I'm still sad about Nikki dying. I'm still sad about Ray dying. I don't think he needed to die. Um, I just, well, no, Ray did need to die because he got, uh, what's his name? Fay to murder or to, to break it. He he trusted a moron to do a simple rob job that turned into a murder. Like ultimately, I think that this this season is about avenging Ennis or bringing Ennis's killer to justice, and not we get to explore his life and or at least his life before. Yeah, like I like if it hadn't been for Ray fucking shit up as usual as he has through Emmett's entire life, things might have actually been relatively fine. Like one dead lawyer. What do you call that? A good start? <laughs> yeah, but that's true. But even then, at the end of it, I would think that given everything Varg has done and how afraid he was when the, when Dollar first showed up, I would figure he'd want to, you know, I mean, the loose ends would be primarily be, because Emmett and Sai, you could tell, yes, they're corrupt for going, for, or they, it's not that they were corrupt, it's that they were scared. And they didn't seek help, but you could tell they weren't corrupt in the sense that they weren't willfully going to go along with Vargas' scheme all willy nilly, like like Ruby Goldfarb would, uh, or vice versa. And so, therefore, I just perceived that he would be the type of person who would have wanted to, you know, cut them both, you know, put them both on the ground afterwards to, uh, you know, get rid of the people who are potentially going to, you know, could bite him later on. But uh, so I was surprised that he didn't do that, considering that. You know, he does eventually say we need to execute Nikki and Ray because they're creating too many distractions. And it's like, okay, yeah, they're creating distractions, but what happens when this scam is over with? And what happens if Emmett, once you're, once the influence of Varga is gone and gone into the ether, what happens if Emmett does, suddenly decides, you know what, I'm going to get this guy, <laughs> you know? So I, I guess I was just kind of surprised. Maybe that, like you said, maybe that was Ruby's uh, request that don't bother Emmett or Sai any more than you have to because... Because she did leave him with the $20 million, so I guess that might be part of it. Because uh, she, I'm assuming she, she didn't take any of the money because she just wanted the comp the assets for cheap. Uh, yeah. She wasn't really interested in the, the hundreds of millions of dollars because she's already, you know, the storage queen of Minnesota, which I thought was odd that Gloria didn't recognize her because she's like, oh, I'm new from here. I'm new in town. Where are you from? Uh, St. Louis. And it's like, uh, but you're introduced at the very first episode as the storage queen of Minnesota, and Gloria didn't really know that and she just kind of oh you're you're new in town but she's really not that new in town i mean <laughs> i don't know well maybe new to that town yeah i guess so and she does say that she was part she was from st louis which yeah so but also like if i think about business like if i were to think about who owns the storage business chain in my region, I couldn't tell you what they looked like. Well, right. I meant that uh, I thought it was funny she's a new in town, but uh, I wonder because she said St. Louis. I don't recall there being anybody by the name of Goldfarb in season four. So maybe because that would probably be that would be 60, 70 years earlier. Well, that was but, Kansas City. Oh, that was Kansas City. That's right. I keep that's right. St. Louis. Never mind. Uh, so that's so she's kind of gotten away with it. And then Emmett unfortunately doesn't get away with it because after having this really nice meal. He goes into the kitchen to get something, 
And as he opens the fridge and looks inside, Mr. Wrench is behind him and shoots him dead to avenge Nikki. Yes. And who knows why it took him five years to do it, but it did. And uh, that so Emmett has now paid for his sins of the original sin of having swindled his brother out of the out of the stamp to start his whole company. And like Ray says, you're not better than me. And and you can tell, even though Emmett says I'm a fair man and all of this kind of stuff, that he does think he's better than Ray, even though he's the one who had to steal from Ray in order to, you know, get everything that he wanted. Well, and Eugene asks a good question in the chat. Are there any episodes where someone doesn't die? Uh, the answer is yes. The answer is yes. And yes. Lemon Pie says... Probably there are Fargo episodes in which no one dies, but I hadn't thought of it before. But yes. I think there, yeah, no one died. Let me see. There's it's always the shadow of death. The shadow of death, but not all episodes, no. Actually, in this episode, this season, there wasn't much death at all. Like the lawyer in the first episode, and then Marie Sifle and Anastasi, but then nobody in episodes two, three, four, five. Then in the sixth episode, Ray dies. Then in the seventh episode, um, well, the bus, well, the but he's in the eighth episode because they kind of cross over. Okay. So then nobody dies again to the eighth episode. So it's really these last three. Uh, one of the, the last thing that happened in 2011 in the timeline of the show before, uh, before Emmett's death was uh, Gloria went to the bar to drown her sorrows because of how the how her boss has totally bought into the conspiracy of the man who wants to murder all the sussies. And Winnie Lopez came to see her and she told tells Winnie that she thinks that like this sci-fi story that her grandfather, her uh, stepfather wrote that it's about a robot who keeps going around trying to tell everybody I can help, but nobody listens. And she mentions how she thinks she's the robot because you know, automatic doors and automatic fountains and all this stuff, nothing responds to her. And she, it's like, I don't even feel like I exist. Like, do, what do you think? She's like, that is kind of weird, but she goes on about it. And then Winnie says, I want to show you something. It's interesting. And she's like, okay. So she stands up and then she gives her a hug, like a long, really nice hug. And then Gloria goes to the bathroom and the faucet, the automatic faucet responds to her. It's like, now that she has been acknowledged, technology will respond to her. She's no longer wandering around saying I can help. And so she decides to, resi to resign from the department. Anyway, she flags down her son's school bus and he asks about, you know, his grandpa's murder and she's like, yeah, some of these times you don't have an answer to these things. And that's just the way of the world. Like you said, the whole thing has really been about her trying to get justice for her stepfather and how it just went down this whole rabbit hole. And so then uh, in the final scene of the season, set in 2016, we see that Gloria is now employed as a Department of Homeland Security agent. Uh, this officer takes her into the they're at JFK airport in a side office where a man named Daniel Rand has been detained, having flown in from Brussels, Belgium. It's first clear things first. Hmm. Who's Danny Rand? Like I was saying, it is Varga. He no, no, no. Her. Danny Rand is Iron Fist. Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> and he's in New York, so he's <laughs> and he's like, oh, I'm a software engineer. I sell software. Oh, thank you, Eugene Bird. Very kind of you. Eugene Byrne, our benefactor, once again, swooping in. Yes. And so, thank you for the super stick sticker. It is, it looks like a uh, it looks like a tap dancing, all singing, all dancing chick. And so for that, I thank you. And I am, I am, I cannot help but be touched. Yes. You're an amazing so, dancer. Daniel Rand says that he is a software engineer. He sells things. And she's like, Oh, you live in Brussels then. And he's like, no, I, I'm a citizen of the skies. I travel around the world. And she's like, you probably don't remember me, do you? And he's like, surmise, huh? Well, you surmise that because you don't, that I didn't acknowledge you, that therefore I don't remember you. And she basically lays it out as it is. She's like, well, Ennis Stussy was murdered a few months ago, or Emmett Stussy was murdered a few months ago, and this kind of thing. And he alludes, and he re immediately references the Stussy conspiracy committed by the murders committed by Donald Wu. And she's like, but that's not happened. That, di that didn't happen. He's like, yeah, it did. It's a story. It happened. I read it. it it's a fact. And she says, no, but let me tell you what's going to happen. Uh, you're going to be indicted on charges inv involving murder, money laundering, and uh, tax fraud and all that type of stuff. And you're going to go to Rikers Island and be eating mashed potatoes out of a box in a dark room 
while I'm going to be back home at, at the fair with my son having corn dogs and glazed uh, donuts and all that type of stuff. And he said, and he sits there and he listens to her and he says, well, the thing about Emmett, you, you think I killed Emmett. Well, I was in Brussels and she's like, well, you can call their phone call for there. You could have arranged it over the phone. And he says, I suppose that the death of Emmett is sadder than the death of somebody who's a wasteful person who's just a leech on society. Therefore, uh, Emmett's death is more tragic than, you know, an average person on welfare or whatever. And Gloria just can't believe that he said that. And she's like, oh, that's just as horrible. That's a horrible thing to say. And he's like, and she just lays it out. Nope, somebody's going to come in here in five minutes and take you away. And you're going to go to prison. There's nothing you can do about it. And he says, no. She's like, huh? It's like, no. In five minutes, somebody's going to come in here you can't argue with, and they're going to let me go, and now they'll pat you on the back and maybe even give you a little promotion or whatever, but I'm going to leave, and there's nothing you can do about it. And us having any further debate about this is pointless. It'd be a waste of breath, and one thing I cannot stand is waste. And then he just says, goodbye. And the light dims, much like the like he tells like the cartoon who tells the robot, you're done now, and shuts down. And then the camera just kind of zooms in towards the clock as Gloria is like, nope, Rikers and uh, uh, Rikers and Glaze Snickers. Donuts. Like, this is your future and this is mine. But you could tell there's a little bit of doubt and they leave it unresolved. What did you think of this ending? I enjoyed the end. Well, before, before we get to the final thing, it reminded me a lot of Lord of War. Where mm -hmm. it was Nicolas Cage saying it to Ethan Hawke and saying exactly the same thing. It was nearly identical. Saying, someone's going to knock on the door. They're going to say that I can go. They're going to say that you did a great uh, deal for law enforcement or whatever. But there's nothing you can do because this is the way the world works. Uh, in terms of the way it ended, I am happy. Because in my mind, Gloria won. Yes. Gloria. Have, yeah. Gloria caught him. Gloria is from the Minnesota branch of the Department of Homeland Security. Got there, got her man because of the competent police force that she was a part of at this point. Like they say, facial recognition matches and all that jazz. I believe that that man was taken to jail. Now, I read a little bit about what Noah Hawley had to say, and he was like, really? Based on everything you've seen this season, you think that justice was done. Neat. Interesting. And he wanted specifically to leave it so that the cynical could say Varga got away. But he wanted to leave it open so that the optimistic could say that Gloria won. And I, I have spoken to many people on the internet who abhor ambiguous endings. I am not one of them. I enjoy audience participation or speculation at the end of a story so that I get to choose. It's my adventure. I invested this much time. And I want Gloria to win. I am glad the most out of all of the Fargo's that I've seen so far, aside from uh, Jerry Gunderson, Lundegaard. Uh, Lundegaard, Jerry Lundegaard screaming like a stuck pig at the end. That made me happy because justice was done for that pussy ass coward bitch. And this time when Gloria got a hug, and then the tap and the soap dispenser worked for her. I was like, oh, finally. <laughs> I was so happy. And so when she's sitting there, she's not worried. She has a confident look on her face. Like, there's no way. This is going to work out. And I was like, fucking A. <laughs> finally, Burgle. Good work. So I loved the ending of this. And I loved it, especially because the question can still be raised. Did he get away? I don't, I don't think it's as ambiguous. I think Peter caught the wolf because all season long, we have seen Varga 
you know, tell these little, speak in metaphors and parables and all this stuff. And every single time he's doing it, there is a very specific reason why. Like when he shows up to Emmett's house, walking out of the woods and says, the, the mongrel hordes are coming and the peasants are the pitchforks and you have to insulate yourself and your family. And look at me, I'm wealthy, but you don't see it. Notice how he doesn't provide any proof that he's telling the truth about being wealthy. He's just selling all this shit. And he's trying to sow seeds of doubt in Emmett's mind because his goal in that particular scene was to get Emmett to sign him on as a partner. So you would have more power at the company. When he tells the three true stories, the one being very true about the collapse of Lehman Brothers, the second one being uh, not really that, that true about the uh, sandwich because sandwiches wouldn't really have been in Sarajevo at that time for uh, the, the urban legend that uh, the assassin of Archduke Ferdinand ate a sandwich and that's why he got his target. Uh, and then the, the completely bogus story about the moon landing. Well, he's doing that because he could sell that Sai is not going to be on board with this, and he's trying to drive a further wedge between them. He also tells the story about the crooked man and the crooked house at Crooked Lane because he's trying to make Emmett feel less guilty about killing his brother because he can't afford these distractions. So every time he tells a weirdo bo weird story, it's because he's trying to get something. He's trying to get something that he needs. He never has provided any proof whatsoever that he has any of these connections or, com or powers that he claims to have. And as we both surmised, the widow Goldfarb is the one who gave him the money to make the investment in the first place. She hired him to do this. Mm. And so for the first time in the entire season, somebody has called Varga out on his bullshit, and that's Gloria. When he says, oh, that's not going to happen. That's a true – oh, it's a, the Donald Wu committed those murders. That's a true story. And she's like, well, no, it's not. It's just a story. And even though Gloria may not have the evidence to prove for the murders, I think, and even though it's been five years, so he could feasibly have paid off the right people. But here's the thing. It, thematically, yes, the bad guys in Fargo get what they deserve. You might be right that the that Ruby Goldfarb is the one who was nice and gave Emmett the money because she's not a killer and that it, Varga's the one who did all the murders and all the conspiracies and all that type of stuff. Therefore, the villains get their comeuppance. He is caught. She is the first and only person who has not fallen for his bullshit. And true to what Noah Hawley said, he will probably not face that much harsh of a punishment. Because like we saw with Emmett, he only got two years probation for this massive fraud where he stole $200 million from the government or the banks or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, Varga may get the same if they can even find out what his name is. So he might get hauled off. He'll get hauled off to jail, but not. he might not be there very long. But she still has the satisfaction of, I got you. And you're not going to talk your way, talk your bullshit at me because I'm not going to buy, I'm not going to bite. Because I, I just, the whole thing with Vargas, I thought all season long, everything has just been a con with him. Like, I don't think he's actually that way or that weird. It's like an act that he's putting on. Yes, he has a portrait of Stalin in the truck, <laughs> but maybe that's just for his own steely resolve. But everything has just been a con job. So now that somebody has finally stood up to the con job, it's like, what is a con man? It's just, it's a flim flam. There's nothing to it. Much like when he escaped the elevator, he just left behind an empty suit because that's all he is. He's nothing. And Emmett was the one who bought all the security, not Varga. And so I think he's just full of hot air. There's nothing to him. And now that he's caught and she's not going to listen to any of his bullshit anymore, uh, I think he's done. Because the Farga, the, the Coen Brothers universe says, that's what happens to the bad guys in Fargo. They get caught. Even, um, yes, we argued that in season five, Lorraine Lyon is, has her corruption celebrated. But you could tell that season leaned more into the absurd and the, you know, Roy Tillman obviously being the villain and getting everything he deserved. But here, Varga, he, clear, he is evil. It would be a major departure for him to just walk away. And yes, I agree with Holly that he's justice is most certainly not going to be served, but I don't think that necessarily means that somebody's going to walk in the room and let him just walk away. Cause everything we've seen about Varga all season long just tells us he's an empty suit and that there's nothing to him. Yeah. So that was well, my takeaway. Again, I, I could, I could speculate as to what, what happened after those five minutes transpired. Uh, However, I think I would like to I would like to uh, bask in the optimism of justice being done at the very least for Gloria and Ennis. Uh, 
I don't know what is behind that, as you say, that empty suit. Uh, but I, if I investigate it and I try and put dots together, like if I, I believe that the term is connecting dots, Scott, if I want to connect those dots, I don't know where that truck, that, you know, microchip from Punisher tactical center came from. I don't know where that was. That wasn't uh, Ruby Goldfarb. Uh, I don't know. Sorry. He could have paid for it. She could have, maybe. Or maybe it was part of the maybe it was part of the, the deal. Maybe there was like you have to facilitate you yeah, have to facilitate such a thing. Because like, I he, think it's a safe assumption that he's the one who called her when she was at dinner with Emmett to make sure that the that he's doing what he's supposed to be, which is don't act too oh. surprised when they tell you your murder. Because I thought that because she's on the phone with somebody and she's like, Yeah, the cops are here now and they're telling him. I assume that was Varga calling her to make sure and that she is the one who tipped off Varga about the IRS having the drives. So they, I believe they've been in league with us so that she's been his financier because she at yeah. least is a legitimate person. And, and the one thing that Varga loses at the end of the season, if, if he walks away, if the charges don't stick and he makes bail and disappears again, well, now they've got his fingerprints. And if it's a felony, they got his DNA. So mm -hmm. his invisibility at the very least is compromised. Uh, but that's the thing. I, it just I grant it's just a theory of mine. But I just it's like a lot of people think, oh, he's funny and weird. But when you look back at every little weird thing he says throughout the season, it was always for a very specific objective. And this is really the first time. And he was trying to sow seeds of doubt in Gloria's mind, almost like if she starts doubting herself now in the interrogation room, since she's the one running this show, apparently she's the one who wants to bring all the charges. Well, if she starts doubting herself enough and losing confidence then okay, the cops come in to arrest him. But if you're not really on your toes when it comes time to try and make anything sick, he's just going to walk anyway. Even if she has, even if she were to have all the evidence in the world, if she doesn't believe in it and she's the only one trying to press the charges, everybody's going to see through that and he's going to walk. And that's all he has left that he can do at that point is just sow seeds of doubt in her mind, which he's been doing with other people all season long to dramatic effect. But she's been the smart one who is not going to cave into it. And one could argue that if Winifred did not give her that hug acknowledging that she is a real person and that she matters, then maybe she would be the one shutting off instead of Varga. <laughs> like when he says goodbye, almost like he's the, the robot. Cause some people have interpreted that way too. It's like they specifically show the light dimming on him almost as if he's shutting down now disappearing or whatever evil entity possesses him is leaving. And now it's just the guy, you know, or something. So it's, it's kind of weird how they do it, but I figured that, in general rules of Coen Brothers rules, the bad guys get their comeuppance. The good guys who have always been good triumph in one way or another. But even the whereas good people who sometimes do bad things even get punished for it. And the fact that Varga was so deathly afraid of LaRue Dollard showing up at Stussy Lots in the first place tells me that he's not as connected as he pretends to be. Because otherwise, what would be the worst thing that could happen? You just cut your losses on this one scam and live to scam another day. But he was petrified. He was sitting back in his office like, like biting his nail, twitching his He was afraid of that. It's like, do you really have a bunker in Gestad and a, a bunch of corporate jets lined up to distract, to trick people into thinking you're off doing something else? Like when he's telling Emmett about what wealth really means. It's like, do you really have that many connections when you're sitting there squirming in your seat because of one IRS agent who he very quickly gets rid of, but he was still afraid of him. So to me, that's like a symptom which shows that he's not or a clue, rather, that he's not as connected as he pretends to be. Well, but also, it is, as, like, as Gloria says to her son, when they're eating their popsicles, it's like, I can't explain what's going on, what happened with your, with your grandfather. And he's like, oh, that wasn't my grandfather. And it's like, he was one of God's creatures, and all we really have is the people that we care for. And we got to stick together, is the people who we love now that's that's what we have to do and she's she's recently dealt with an existential crisis where she doesn't believe that she exists and at that moment at the end of the season she's sitting across from a man with no one no one loves him he doesn't love anybody in fact he doesn't exist is he is he Danny Rand or Daniel Rand or, or is he B.M. Varga? Varga? <laughs> He's nobody. And so even in the superiority 
Like even in even if Varga has all the connections in the world, someone comes in and lets him go. Gloria is still in a better position because she sat across the table from a sad, pathetic liar with fucked up teeth. And that comes from a guy who used to have fucked up teeth. Still do. Oh, yeah. well, that's what I like to call him. Like, it, it, is, it is a victory just to be able to look at that conniving demon and just know even if you walk out of here, you're walking out alone. I still get to go and have my uh, son's birthday tomorrow and we're going to go to the fair. And what are you going to do? Even if you don't have a box of, uh, of mashed potatoes, I won and I got to see you and I got to tell you whatever your name is. Fuck you. And <laughs> I wish you said that to him. <laughs> Team Gloria. Absolutely. I wish you said that. Because that's coincidentally the uh, or incidentally the name of the final two episodes, Aporia and Somebody to Love. Mm -hmm. But you're right; he doesn't have anybody or anything. But he, and the way he sums up the tra the the fact that Emmett's life is a tragedy because it was worth value and money and everything about him is doll. And it's almost like he is a paper man because all he cares about is the paper dollar value of certain things. And I like how the final scene is ultimately a parallel between the very cold open of the season. Where in that scene, you had a very unreasonable guy in a suit talking down to the little guy who's trying to reason with him. He's not listening. And now the power dynamic is switched where the guy in the suit this time is the one who's uh, the cop is now the reasonable person. And the so-called innocent guy is actually bad. It's like the world has switched back around. It's like Varga's world is what you see in the prologue of the season where, oh, let's say we're going to state facts however we want the facts to be. No matter how reasonable you are, we're going to do this and we're going to fuck this up and you're going to have to deal with it. And now at oh. the end of the season, it's the other way around where she is the law but is upholding the good nature of it rather than where, – whereas the little guy, Varga, is now the one who's spinning all the stories. Uh, whereas the Stasi agent was the one spinning the stories in the beginning of the season. So I like that role reversal. That is interesting, and I was curious about how that was going to play out. But now that you met, and I didn't get it until you mentioned just now, we fin we begin at a desk and we end at a desk. And that's another thing to think about is we can see that Jacob Underlauder uh, probably got hanged or sent to a gulag or, or prison forever for whatever because of a murder that Yuri Gurkha committed because the Stasi agents were being unreasonable and, and lazy and stupid and decided, oh, blah, blah, blah. And so now at the end of the season, it's now Varga is the one who's, and that's another thematic reason to think he is going to get hauled off to jail. Now, granted, that doesn't necessarily mean the charges are going to stick. Like, again, they're not, but they'll, if it's a felony, then uh, they will have, which it is because she's charging with murder, all of this, which questionable if she's been able to find any actual evidence, but they'll have his DNA, they'll have his fingerprints, and his anonymity will be gone. Even if he doesn't have an actual birth certificate and they don't know his name. They have his, like they said, facial recognition. They they got you. You're not going to be able to disappear anymore. We'll give it to Interpol. You're 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 not going to be able to execute these schemes nearly as flawlessly as you have in the past because you're now in the system, so to speak. That he's been so desperate to make invisible to him, or make himself invisible to. Well, and we even with uh, even with new sheriff or new chief, yeah, like he's a specific analogy for that initial scene as well because it was a matter of okay we have the facts and it's like but those those you may have facts that coincide with what you want to present but that's not the truth right. and that's what this entire season is about this is a true story uh oh, notice no how that changed too like in the early episodes it said this is a true story and the word true would fade out and it says this is a story but yeah. in the last few episodes it didn't do that it just said this is a true story and I thought, okay, that's interesting. It's almost like now they want you to believe in the bullshit <laughs> as the, the way the thematically has been kind of playing out. Um, so but I just I, like, yeah. Well, I get. I, I don't mean to. I don't mean to cut you off. Please. No. Oh well, I, I guess the ultimate question then did was justice served for the original crime, which is really the bigger crime, um, the murder of Anastasi. And I would say, well, the literal killer, Marisa Fay, got killed by Nikki. Yep. And both Nikki and Ray, they may not have met actual justice, but they met some sort of karmic, you know, or co cosmic karma in that Ray got killed. Uh, 
essentially he got killed by the thing he was asking Maurice to steal. <laughs> that's the thing which ends up literally killing him. So that's yeah. cosmic universal justice. And Nikki, meanwhile, uh, who's been the one who really prodded Ray to do this in the first place, is now killed by the law um, and by her own inept in part in her own choices. So it's fortunate for Gloria because she doesn't actually get them to it. Because I, it's like you kind of want Gloria it, to get Ray or Nikki to admit to it. Like, yes, we did it, and this is how it happened. Kind of like in the movie where uh, she never, she doesn't get to catch the villain. She, you know, the the other troopers are the one who catch Jerry. She doesn't get to look Jerry in the eye after that and tell him, I know you're guilty. Uh, she implied it when she had that second interview with him, but she doesn't get the satisfaction of him breaking down in front of her. And so the best that Gloria can do is get to Varga because really she didn't even think about Varga until uh, LaRue Dollard called her at the end. Like she, he wasn't even on her radar. It's like, yeah, she met him once and thought he was a little weird, but she didn't really. And yes, he is the wolf and she is Peter. I'll be at Peter and the wolf, but really her case and what she wanted all along was justice for her stepfather, and she didn't really get it. Well, it, it, it is, I think it, it's a nice culmination simply because <laughs> there are facts, and you yeah. can make up a story around those facts to make them fit, and that's what New Chief does. What's his name? Mo Damick. Mo Damick. And, sorry, Damick. His first name is Mo, last name Damick. It's not Mo Damick. <laughs> that was my, I just misheard. Damick is just like, we have these facts. It fits what I want. So let's just fucking wrap it up. I'm a hero. And fitting facts to a story, a true story, you can do that all you want. Yeah. Gloria is in search of the truth. And she's going to go throughout the galaxy for two million years, say, I, I can help, but she can't. She can witness all the truth she wants, but it's never going to fit the facts of someone else who wants to make it fit their puzzle. And when in the end, I I feel like she found truth. I feel like even if he gets away, I feel like she found truth. Yeah, and it, she did. And it reached out and it touched a brother's heart. <laughs> yeah, because in I, the spirit of things sticking to facts, I doubt that Mo Damick tried to solve the mystery of why somebody would have flipped the prison bus, because I believe that Mimo left that device behind that they used to jackknife the bus, which would yeah. indicate that it clearly was not an accident. And, uh, but they don't ever provide what reason they came up with to explain that. And I think that the, the dots that Gloria would connect is that, okay, you had, when he had seen uh, Yuri and Mimo at Stussy Lots, Yuri is the guy they found dead in the woods. They have somebody flip the truck, uh, Gloria has seen Mimo's dead body pulled out of the shootout and they can connect them to Sussy lots. They can connect them to the hard, well, the hard drives are stolen as per what was going on at this company and the financial information tells the rest of the story. And so it's kind of like you could piece this all. It's like, she can kind of piece a story, but the question is, can you prove it? And that's a, something that, you know, Varga doesn't even want to say you could prove it because he's insisting that it isn't even a true story, which is great. And that's been I the mean, theme of 2017 when this series came out was facts and alternative facts, which leads Eugene Bird. Misinformation and disinformation. Yes. Yeah, so Eugene Bird asked me if it makes me consider law enforcement. Uh, no, because it's a lot more uh, mundane than this. And uh, at least not the law enforcement around here either. Uh uh, my day job, uh, I've done a lot of editing and sound design and work and sound mixing and that kind of stuff uh, independently because I have a whole editing suite here and sound mixing suite that you can't see. Uh, and that does uh, fetches pretty nicely for me. And I, I love, and I love that. It, it's really great. Um, but this is again, like this is exciting from a TV perspective, but reality is a very different kind of like, I remember watching hot fuzz and I like the joke at the end of the movie that Edgar Wright wanted to put in there that everybody then has to do all the paperwork with the mountains and mountains of paperwork that are involved for all the chaos that they'll never show you in any cop movie. <laughs> and the fact that every primetime cop show you watch is littered with inaccuracies um, to make it more entertaining for the audience. And admittedly Fargo tries to feel more grounded, kind of like when the Rue Dollar says, Oh yeah, it's legal. It's just, uh, you just have to pay your taxes. <laughs> even though the bank I think would kind of be upset about losing that kind of money that they didn't get back. Well, I guess that's what he means then because 
law the, the law would obviously care about the taxes, but the bank would be the that would be a private matter for them to settle if they wanted to, you know, complain about it. And Insurance. and I bet the bank wouldn't want to admit they were taken for that much money because that would instill a lack of confidence in their uh their other account holders. Uh so yeah, I think yes, like so lemon pie says he thinks it's fine if I put it out there now. So it's simply that I find no character very compelling as a villain or sympathetic as a protagonist. It's a bland season visually and in every way. Uh, well, there, there, there are a couple. I want to, I want to go through, and then we can, we can go through the the full uh, assessment. Yeah, Lemon goes on to say, yes. Yeah, so so it's, it's just an absence of anything that sticks out to me that's great about it, especially compared to seasons one and two. But I'll give it credit for being different from the other seasons and attempting something new and different as each season does. Yes, um, I would say this is definitely better than season four. I liked it better on the whole than season five. Um, season two is still the best. Season one definitely has the best character, but this is my favorite season. And <laughs> because I like the story, I like the absurdity of it, but it wasn't ab absurd in a season five way. Um, but it was kind of. I, because I find this stuff very interesting, all these financial conspiracies. I think Varga is my favorite Fargo character because he's just so overtly weird in the way he manipulates everybody because he's so bizarre. I liked Gloria and the parallel they did with her stepfather's story. I can help. I can help. And how they do give you that triumph at the end for her own personal triumph over Varga. And uh, and, the, and just the t how diametrically opposed they are. Like you said, she's satisfied because she has family, people that love her. She loves other people, whatever. You want to be an empty suit and go on, then fine. Uh and so I did, and I liked the the supporting cast. I thought it was the funniest season. Uh, Michael Stuhlbarg is <laughs> really great in this season as Psy, and of course the dual performances from Eo McGregor. So I really I, I really liked it. I do agree with you though that it is visually bland. You could definitely see the color grading on every episode. They're trying to give it this kind of muted look. Like if you compare it to season one or just the vibrancy of colors of seasons, like seasons one and two look color grade the same way. Season three, you could tell they put like a brown, like brownish gray filter on every shot. And I'm not sure why they chose to do that because it does make it look like it was enough that it was noticeable and not necessarily in a good way. And it does give it that bland feel. And maybe that was the attempt because to your point, Lemon Pie, you mentioned earlier, oh, bankruptcy, a, m a money launder, all this kind of stuff. It's not very interesting and it's bland. It kind of like Luru Dollar says, yeah, it's all legal, but it's just kind of bland and that's how people get away with this shit. <laughs> and so... I just find, I just find, like, again, I find numbers and everything. I'm the type of person where when somebody mentions in a movie, they start getting into the minutia of it and they stop and they say, oh, but this doesn't interest you. 95% of the audience agrees with that character and says, oh, this doesn't interest you. Let's move on with the story. I'm in the 5% and says, no, stop. I want to hear more about that. <laughs> and, and that's why, and I find this entire season is kind of like a version of that, of that, that minutia that you have to dive into. And that's why I really like it. But I totally get what you mean because yeah, Gloria, some episodes we pointed out in the middle season, she just kind of disappears for a while. It kind of focuses on Ray and Nikki a lot. And then they kind of dropped the whole brotherly feud. It didn't end up escalating any further. It just kind of ended, which admittedly was a bold thing to do. Even TV critics were like, wow, I can't believe you did that. What's the rest of the season going to be about? Um, but it also gave us, uh, like what Scott said last week, one of the two best episodes of TV he'd seen in a long time. Long time. And that was a consensus that a lot of critics had at the time as well. And I think that the, I can't overestimate how big the smile was on my face when that music started playing and you see that Mr. Wrench is back. Like that yeah. was such a great, and to think that you have the team of Mr. Wrench and the Swango going against the wolf and his, and his bland corporate stooges, I thought was going to be really fun. And uh, it kind of was, even though it finds a weird middle ground to kind of end on. Well, and like, I and really care about saying, um Mr. Wrench technically is a villain, but Paul Moraine said he's redeemed. So that's the reason why he doesn't get really his comeuppance either. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and also he was he was released by uh by Lauren Malvo. He was released yeah. by Malvo. And so if there's only one person who can let you out of hell, it's the devil. <laughs> um, but I I I really uh I enjoyed uh, Gloria a lot. I didn't think I was going to at the beginning, but when I did, like, 
when I saw her, her, her look, her caught, like, I was just like, oh, this is just another Marge. Mm -hmm. Like, that's all it is. But her character, I thought, was so uh, dry and not cut off, but she so protects herself based on her backstory that I was sympathetic to her from the beginning. And then when, when she goes to L.A. and that entire, that entire story about finding out who Ennis was, I was hooked. Carrie Coon was fantastic. Uh, and then I was always waiting for that turn of Nikki to be like, I was waiting for her to do the heel turn and turn into more of a villain or try to be more manipulative of Ray. And at the end of the show, she loved Ray. Mm -hmm. And I did not see that coming. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like I thought that was going to be a hollow gesture as they attempted to manipulate her. I thought that she was great. Uh, I felt bad for, for Ray. And when Wise showed up, I got excited because mm -hmm. I love Ray Wise. I've, I'm loving Ray Wise more and more. Um, and I want to seek out his entire filmography, which would take the rest of my life. Um, mm -hmm. I... And I thought that it had a moral ambiguity, and I don't mean that in the way that some people say moral ambiguity, in that you don't know which way it's going to go. I don't know who's good or bad. I know who's good or bad. The moral ambiguity comes from not knowing how the morality is going to play out or conclude. I thought it was a fascinating chapter of Fargo. Uh, I liked it. And I think, yeah, so far, this would probably be my favorite season. Mm, I really? like them all, but I would say this is probably my favorite season out of all of them so far. Oh, wow. I didn't expect that. Yeah. So uh, and, yeah. any other comments before we get to oh, we got Oh, we got plenty. We got plenty. Okay, cool. <clears throat> uh, this is from about an hour and a half ago. Uh, Lemon says, I want to see Varga gone really early on because I just don't want to see or listen to him anymore. Unlike Malvo or the various season two baddies, Lemon, thank you for not specifying who they are. No spoilers for season two, even though we just finished season three. A <laughs> uh, bunch of uh, comments about uh, my internet freezing. Varga froze the internet. Phantom Organist says Canadian internet. And Pi says maple syrup isn't a good signal conduit, which is true. <laughs> very, very true. Uh, poutine on the cables. Or is poutine Canadian or is it in Wisconsin? Nope. Poutine is very Canadian. Uh, Lemon says, you look pained. Have a PBR. No, I'm good, dude. I'm good. Actually, I was told it's a finale, Scott. Be sober. And I think I'm pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and Lemon says, you look sharp. Haircut? Uh, no. Actually, no. This is oldish. But thank you. I appreciate that. And Lemon reinforces with Cat always. Thank you. Did you say thank you or I do? I said thank you. You should say I do. <laughs> well, I do, of course. <laughs> Again, it was so I was so good to see Herc here. Thank you for being yes, here, Herc. man. Sweet it. A lot of hellos, hellos, and it was a pleasure to see Eugene Bird here with the the fly boy and the lemons. And lemon, here's what he here's how lemon said: bankruptcy, taxes, parking lots, insurance, loans, you see, decimal points, exponents. I really wanted at some point in the season to go into the back room that Varga took over at the company at Stussy Lots offices. To see how they're like, did they write a computer algorithm that was doing this, or were they sitting there individually and doing it themselves? Doctor, because you see how the rude dollar arranged all the papers in his office, and it's like the ones they show you, I noticed all ended in zero, zero, like they didn't have even sense on everything was perfect. And it's like, I just wanted, I'm fascinated by that type of stuff, and I just wanted to tie, like, as an editor or sound designer, you're always messing with things like decimals to get your decibels up at the right points you're almost almost like keyframe animation you put the little dips and dots in the sound the edit you have to be very specific about it when you're arranging it and, and splicing down does this transition work does this work here i love that type of stuff and this is meticulous in the same type of way 
but it's almost like they feel it's going to be boring for too many people. So they don't want to go into it. And I feel like maybe if they made it clear, it would be more fascinating to some people because I've seen so many questions over the years pop up on Reddit and other places. Like people asking, can you explain what Vargas scam is exactly? <laughs> Cause people just can't really figure it out because the series, like you mentioned, it's not interested in explaining what it is or what's going on. Cause the point is, it's not really what matters. What matters is there's bad shit going on at the company and him and I are going along with it. <laughs> well, and again, it is that sort of uh, coercion from Varga uh, in, in the middle being like, you think you're rich. You're not. We want you to be wealthy. You can be. You're That's showing right, off. He, says, he, he tells Emmett when he signs the last paper, he says, You've now completed action item one, the accumulation of wealth. <laughs> now you can move on to action item two, the invisibility. <laughs> yes. But he doesn't want to be invisible, and that's the thing. He wanted right. that was Emmett that was because Emmett's kind of like Gloria in that he was a good man. He did one bad thing, which is he tricked his brother into giving him the stamp. But as we both kind of agreed, Ray probably would have blown the money in anyway. But yes. Emmett. He doesn't like. I can tell that even though the the inner titles say he has twenty million in an offshore account, I don't think Emmett's ever going to touch it because he doesn't care about the money. He cares about his family. Yeah. Well, actually, we know he didn't touch it because he's been. Well, he got shot, but he got I don't shot think he touched it. I don't think he touched it in the five year in Tirum that he was back with his family because that's not something that he cares about. Like he he just wants to be with his family, um, which is why I don't know if it felt. I kind of felt bad for Emmett a little bit. It's like yes. I know I've been harping on him because he had all these opportunities to do the right thing and he didn't. But I also feel he's enough of a hapless idiot that it's kind of a bit more somewhat sympathetic and pitiful, which is why it annoyed me that Nikki was reciting that that mantra to him instead of Varga. He's the one who should be blowing away with a shotgun, which to be fair, she was going to until he disappeared from the elevator. But yeah, I did kind of feel bad when Mr. Wrench killed uh, uh I kind of get it. it. It's Fargo. You have to pay for it. Like Cy paid for it by, you know, get, getting poisoned. But uh, Emmett, I, I don't know. I, I felt bad a little bit for him. I think that it was, yeah. I think that that was more of a strengthening of the relationship between Wrench and Nikki than it was. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I actually do agree with that um, more in this season than Zelmer coming back to kill uh, Loy in season four. Like I, I, yeah. I, I get it that Zelmer had a motive, but that felt like something that was cheaply tacked on. Whereas this it's not because you get that Wrench and Nikki did have a tight relationship and you could tell he was surprised that she was going to let him keep pretty much all the money. Uh, and so you could see it in his eyes that he was, He's looking at Emmett like he's evil, but I think it's because he's thinking about Nikki. And so I could accept yes. that more than I could accept Zomer showing up on the porch to just knife Lloyd to death. Uh, well, and again, if you look at if you look at season five, I think that it is the inverse of when Dot tells, you know, uh, the European Ule. Ule when it's just like just embrace love and he takes that bite and he looks actually nourished like it's it's the inverse of that as opposed to having a necessity for revenge or enacting your violent justice why not just have a bite of pie right but i felt that wrench was to your point doing that because he was he for his appreciation for Nikki and yeah, he had an angry look on his face, but I think it's because he felt that this is the guy who she's been chasing. This is what was important to her the entire time. And she paid for it with her life. And this guy got away with it. So I'm going to yeah. finish it for her. I yes. didn't see that as him being as much petty about it. Whereas with yeah. Zelmer killing Loy, it's like, lady, you know what race relations are like. He got blackmailed by a, a white federal U.S. marshal. He didn't really have any in 1950. He didn't really have any other choice but to sell you out. That's your fault for not getting out of town faster. <laughs> um, whereas this, I felt was more I, I didn't hate Wrench for doing it because I understood why he was doing it, and it didn't feel like sure. something is cheap. Whereas I felt Zelmer killing Roy was a bit cheap, and then I did love Dot, of course, appealing yes. to Ole to 
love like family, which it seems like these seasons always get back to that original point of Marge saying, what was all this about just for a little bit of money or a, a little bit of something like that. And, uh, in, in that sort of way. Yes. But much more than season four, this felt like Fargo. Yeah, of course. And yeah. much more than season five, this felt like Fargo. Yeah, because like I, met, I I thought the first four episodes or so of season five, four, or maybe the first half of the season felt very Fargo. And then the second half just became more absurd with dream sequences and really pushing the political commentary, weight, laying it on way too thick. Yeah. Uh, which granted, Holly said he was going to do that deliberately to offset how the tone of the previous season. But this, I feel, as I mentioned before, was political commentary coming off the 2016 election with all the alternative facts and fake truths and all that type of stuff. Because they filmed it from January through March of 2017. It aired from April through June of 2017. And the fact yeah. that there was so much an undercurrent of Russia throughout this season and with Varga with his you know, weirdo metaphors, alternative. I, that's kind of what I, I saw them commenting on, but I felt it was done in a much more tasteful manner in season three than in season five. Well, and when I say, when I say this one feels more like Fargo, they've all felt like Fargo, but this one, I don't know. There's something. See, the fourth season didn't feel like Fargo to me at all. I felt it felt like I, it felt like Fargo, not as much. Yeah. Like, I would, if, when I watch season two, when we watch season two, it'll be interesting because I think that it ends up the way that the five seasons so far have gone. Very far go. I don't know how two goes. Pretty far go. Not so far go. Kind of far go. Or maybe kind of far go, not so far go. But yeah. it all feels far go-ish. Yeah. Some more than others. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, Eugene Bird giving a compliment. I'm going to highlight Eugene Bird's uh, uh, first things first. It's because he's being very flattering, but also I think he's paid his way. <laughs> Eugene Bird says, good evening, Scotty R37, broadcaster extraordinaire. I accept that. Thank you. What do you think, Kat? Yes. What? Liar. Lemon says, I acknowledge that it's different and uh, recognize what it's doing for that. It deserves credit. Just didn't blow wind up my skirt personally. Fair enough, yo. Oh, yeah, for sure. And uh, zip, you're good. Please continue. <laughs> blow wind up my skirt. I haven't heard that phrase before for that, but I like that, actually. <laughs> Eugene says, my wife called me for an hour, and I kept thinking, damn it, I am missing Phantasmagorium. Thank you so huh. much. Don't. Don't know. We're 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 here all the time, yo. We you can check us on the rerun. Don't forget to like and subscribe, share, tell your friends. Uh, but yeah, no, it's always a pleasure to have you here, Eugene. And also, you don't have to drop like a poker chip on the table. You can just come and listen. Oh, and this is this is interactive conversation between Lemon and Eugene talking about wives. I don't know if it's off. It's in the public chat, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I, I feel like I'm listening over in a conversation in a bar or something. <laughs> um, Lemon says, well, Eugene, the seasons move around the same general area of the country. Eugene says there's only like 5,000 people that live in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. How can they have organized crime? It only takes that, two that's people. That's a joke, right? I remember when, even in season one, when they mentioned the Fargo crime syndicate, I just started laughing. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm from North Dakota. My family's from, my mom's side of family's all from North Dakota. Uh, but I thought, yeah, I thought that was funny. Like, that just something that I just, this is also the first season that, the only season so far, I believe, that has not had a single scene set in Fargo. Uh, or no scene, re no relationship to Fargo. Like even in season four, they mentioned the guy from Fargo, even though they don't go there. But in this season, there's not a mention of Fargo at all for any of it. The whole thing was in uh, Minnesota, um, and then they California, say about the, California. Do they say anything about the Twin Cities or anything? Well, Twin Cities would be Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, okay. Minnesota. But no, no, there was no mention of Fargo or anything Fargo in oh. this season. Uh, if she murders me, ask her to do it in South Dakota so that Scotty and Kat can rap about it. <laughs> Eugene says. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Uh, yeah. Please don't die. 
<laughs> yes. uh, we have fracking. There's a fracking conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. I heard the news. That would be local. interesting if a series of a future season of Fargo were to get into that, like some conspiracy around the fracking. Oh, in uh, terms of. He wants to do more period. Pe he, like Kali says he wants a season, another one in the 70s, one in the 60s, one in the 80s and the 90s. So it might be a while before we get back to modern, more modern era. I would be uh, so down for an 80s. Yes. Eugene says, I heard on the news the energy industry was attracting people. Have you been there, Lemon Pie? Well, I know that the oil industry was really booming up there for a while. Um, once upon a time, we looked into my grandma's land because she was Chippewa and had a parcel of land up there to see if there'd be any oil on it, but no. Uh, <laughs> Lemon says, Eugene, I haven't been to North Dakota, but yes, oil has been driving growth, and I've read about that and how the state has changed. That's true. Hmm. Uh, there were, for a while, a hell of a lot of oil jobs you could get there to work the oil fields up there. Uh... But it is still true that plenty of places uh, in North Dakota are pretty sparse. Like my grandfather, maternal grandfather and grandmother are all from Minot. Uh, and when he went to enlist, when his brothers went to enlist in World War II, they went to California to do it. And they said, you got to come out here. It's great. And then he went to California, Southern California. He never looked back. <laughs> Uh, Eugene says, Herc 130 will know that we used to joke about Minot Air Force Base there, where they send you to get back at one's misdeeds in the Air Force. Well, mm. if there's one thing I understand about uh, corporals is that they punish. That is not an Air Force rank, but I think you get my meaning. Lemon Pie says, Scotty smiles with glee when mentioning the shadow of death. I do. I enjoy it very much. <laughs> Um, and Eugene Bird clarifies his super sticker. It was a gay pair, but at least it was raining Twinkies. <laughs> uh, Eugene Bird says supernatural, like Twin Peaks. No, I think Twin Peaks is more overt with its otherworldly dimensionality. Yeah, because technically speaking, the only supernatural thing that Malvo did in season one was do pull off the vanishing act from Lester's basement. And while he told uh, Molly's dad that, Oh, that's the best pie I've had since the garden of Eden. It's like, yeah, it could have just been him saying that to make a point, but he doesn't really do anything other, other supernatural throughout the season, unless you want to call him blowing away the Fargo crime syndicate get effortlessly is somehow supernatural, but not really. And then in season three, you know, we had, you know, Varga pull off his disappearing act and then the car breaking down and starting up again. And, uh, and, the, and the, the, Paul Moraine, obviously the whole bowling alley, uh, purgatory thing that, that clearly is supernatural, but one begs the question, did that actually happen? Or were Nikki and Reg just so exhausted that they just kind of thought it happened? And cause the implication seemed to be that Yuri died of toxic shock, blood loss or whatever, somewhere in the mm. woods. So Oh Maybe no! It didn't actually happened, but Paul Moraine. But yeah, I, I guess it did happen. So Paul Moraine definitely it was Ray special. Wise. Yeah, Ray Wise, and then season five with Ole Monk, of course. And it was yeah. kind of ambiguous. Like, is he five hundred years old, or is it just his ancestors? And he's just the same actor because he plays the same. He, he's they use the same actor for the flashback sequences to the Middle Ages. So that could either be saying it's the same family, or it's literally supposed to be the same person. Uh, so yeah, all the and I can't remember if season four had supernatural. I mean, a literal supernatural event when that tornado came oh. out of nowhere and killed characters. Well, in the, the ghost. Moment. <laughs> remember the ghost? Oh, that's right. The go That's right. They had the ghost, and that was something that never really got a proper. Oh, it was a, a the ghost of a family that was haunting our slave uh, slave plantation. Yeah. Owners. that was just kind of weird. So. Yeah, but again, it was supposed to be—it was supposed to be like the 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 specter of of racial disparity throughout American history, kind of thing, wasn't it? Yeah, something like that. Because that's kind yeah. of the thesis of the season is that oh, those uh, yeah, everybody's should, racist. The minorities shouldn't be fighting each other; they should be uniting against the oppressor. And at the end of the day, based on the hierarchy, the Italians are going to be higher than uh, the blacks, unfortunately. Uh, well, and that's fighting. Which again, it's one of those things at the end of the episode or end of the season when Loy is, is knifed to death by a member of his own ethnicity. So, yeah. Uh, Eugene is is curious about uh, Pro Tools, Cubase. Oh, so I, I, 
I wish I was using Pro Tools. I used that in college because that's an expensive program that costs like ten thousand dollars, and I don't, I don't got that kind of money. <laughs> uh, Premiere is one I've been on, but that's you know subscription service. But I also use DaVinci Resolve because I got a Blackmagic cinema camera, and that comes with lifetime free upgrades for DaVinci Resolve, uh, which started out primarily as a color grading tool, but now it's a whole editing software, and they've added sound stuff to it. So they're just kind of building on it. So I got a sweet deal with that. So that's fun. I use paint, Microsoft paint. Cat <laughs> Lemon says, Cat and Scotty, you gave a compelling argument why it's an interesting season, though. Well, again, same, like, if you don't like it, that's cool. If it didn't blow your skirt up, that's cool. But I'm glad that you enjoyed one and two. Like, it's all here for us to enjoy and varying level. Your mileage may vary, I believe, is the term. Yeah. Well, glad we can make it sound more interesting. <laughs> yeah. Don't watch it. Just rewatch these. Uh, <laughs> Lemon says, Scotty makes a good point about the ending. Choose your own adventure. I think that that's something I am a big proponent of when you're viewing art. It speaks to people individually and there is no correct answer. If you don't like it, more power to you. If you love it, more power to you. I hope that people who want to celebrate something get together and if you if it's your jam to talk about how bad something is, if you guys have fun sort of discovering good stuff through the shit you hate, then at least the shit you hate got you to a positive end, I think. Well said. Lemon says cat is all the more attracted to the minutia. Yeah. Yes. I think. And I enjoy that. I enjoy that a lot. It's, it's, you know, exploring the minutia is how you get to find out more of the stuff you like or don't. Um, I felt bad for Sal. Sai. Sai. Yeah, Sai. Well, I think Sai is supposed to be short for Sylvester, maybe. So S-Y. Um, oh, Sai. Uh, like my great uncle Sai, also short for Sylvester, and they called him Sai. But um, uh, that's, um, yeah, I did feel bad for Sai because... Again, he's also a hapless idiot at the beginning of the season, thinking he's so much better than Ray and everybody else trying to, you know, strut himself around in that ridiculous Hummer and stuff. But he didn't deserve to get poisoned and paralyzed like that for the rest of his life. Uh, no. And he was somebody you could tell was legit afraid and nervous trying to figure out what to do. And it was more so his loyalty to Emmett that prompted him not to go try and find a way out of it. Because he told him we should probably just sell the company to Goldfarb. Or, yeah, he, he was... You could tell he if if they weren't as afraid or if Emmett gave him the go ahead, he probably would have gone to the cops or done something. But because he was loyal to Emmett, he wasn't going to betray that, no matter how big the wedge was between them. Yes. Edge of Time is here. Greetings from the Edge of Time. Hail Edge of Time. Thank you so much for being here, yo. Uh, Lemon says two feels like super Fargo to me. Mm. Oh, for sure. I'm looking forward to it because I love Ted Danson and Kirsten Dunst. I'm looking forward to season two so hard, hmm. but it's going to be a bit. Uh, we get a smiley face, uh, a, la a happy, crying, sweaty man chuckling. I think that's what that emoji is. <laughs> uh, I'd also love to see an 80s Fargo season and they should play Madonna's Into the Groove. You know, it's interesting that you bring that up, Lemon, is, is, is just that... I think that the use of soundtrack has been interesting and not gratuitous. And that has been throughout the entire series. Like when, when needle drops happen, they don't take me out of it. I'm like, Oh, this song, or what is this song? Cause it's usually new, but I think that the, the soundtrack and uh, music from this entire series has been fantastic. Yeah, we've seen that Mimo was actually because he's always got those earbuds in him. When we finally hear when he when the truck got hijacked, he was listening to that uh, Be Beethoven or uh, Johann Brahms or one of the two, and that's the one that's also playing for the final in the final scene uh, that he's been listening and dancing the classical music the whole time. Yes, which I thought was rad. Yeah, uh, Edge of Time says there's no I there. There's no I in choose your own adventure. That's true. You ever think about that? No, you're too focused on yourself, you second person. Uh, yeah. 
That's true because I'm pretty much here for me. Although I, I wish you're right though. There were a lot of people who were upset about the ambiguity of the ending, but I think the way we hashed it out is that it's not really that ambiguous because looking at the way it parallels with the opening scene of the season versus like the way you laid it out, that Gloria has something to live for and he doesn't is kind of ultimately what matters. She's has her own reconciliation and realization that I exist now. She's gotten past her own existential crisis and that's all that counts. Like she didn't get shut down by Varga like happened in the cartoon with the robot being shut down by the scientist. And that's kind of the ultimate takeaway so that it really, like when, like when Noah Hawley says, do you really think uh, based on everything you've seen this season that he's, that justice will prevail. And it's like, I don't perceive that as him providing a definite answer so much as him saying, that's really not the point, yo, <laughs> you know, that's not what matters. Sort of like when people ask Christopher Nolan, what is the spinning top at the end of inception? Does it stop spinning? And it's like, that's not the point. <laughs> it's like, yeah. That's the, yeah. Well, and, and it's, it's a quote that I found recently and I'm sure I brought it up before on other streams, but I found a quote recently of David Lynch saying when you finish making a movie and then people watch it, they want the filmmakers to talk about the movie. And then he sort of winces and says, the movie is the thing that does the talking. I don't have to. I created something for the audience. You receive it, interpret it as you wish. I'm not here to hold your hand through it. Now I'm paraphrasing and getting a little, loquacious with it but that's exactly what it is why don't you take the art and interpret it as you will plus considering the theme of the season this is a true story or it's a story or it's true or the past is malleable or the moon landing was fake i don't know it's up to you Right, which is really epitomized, I think, when Mo Damick has actual facts, and then Gloria also has actual facts, but they gel to tell, but they tell two very different stories. Hmm. But the final word seems to be from Edge of Time, who says, "Needs more tentacles, to be honest," and I agree with that wholeheartedly. <laughs> so, so rating, rating, uh, I'm out of ten. I think. What I oh I'm gonna give it I'm gonna give it. You keep telling me that two is the best. I can't remember. Do we really have good. a good of what we voted last time? Or no, what? Or... But it doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah. Um. <laughs> season one, I think I gave a nine. Season. I think four, I did two. I think I gave season four a four. Uh, season five, I think I gave a seven. Um, a six and a half or a seven. I'm giving this an eight. Yeah, um, I'm giving this an eight as well, or eight and a half. It's funny because it's like I, I I said it's my favorite season, even though I ranked season one higher. Because yes, yeah, season one as a story holds together a lot better. They don't have as many holes in it, but it's kind of like when you watch something that's a guilty pleasure, you know other people don't like it, and you know there's a bunch of problems with it, but you still love it, and so. Yes, sure. this is my favorite season, but I acknowledge it's not as good as the first season in terms of the script and the characters. But it's still my favorite. But I'm going to give it a, or probably an eight instead of an eight and a half. I'll give I'll give it an eight. I think I think I gave season one a nine. I think I'm going to give this one a nine as well because I prefer the resolution of this season to the resolution of season one. Okay. So, um, but I'm going to. So they're on par for different reasons. Maybe I will. And ultimately, this is my favorite. <laughs> ultimately, we'll get down like once I'm at a disadvantage because I still haven't seen season two. So we'll probably finish off when we do season two. We'll probably figure out what our rating is for each season. Yes. So that makes sense to me. Now, next week. <clears throat> this just in we are doing something different yes we are taking a break from fargo next week because i will be gone the week after next and we don't want to start it just to stop again for two weeks so right. next week we will be doing a, a movie um event horizon yes in honor of it getting a the 4k steelbook got a limited edition reprint that just went out so we will be watching that and covering that next 
uh, Thursday, and we yes. will have special guests as well. So that will be uh, fun. Yes, that is going to be fun. Uh, and uh, the special guests, I'm sure, will be announced throughout the week. Yes, as we make sure that they will indeed be here. Yes. <laughs> so uh, that'll be probably 7 o'clock next week, if not 7.30, probably 7. I, I pushed this one back because there was another show going on. And I got distracted playing a video game, and I'm like, "Oh shit, I gotta watch." <laughs> uh, uh, so, yes. And then, an, uh, and then we'll decide. Then we'll decide because we had machinations for what we're having after your return. Um, mm -hmm. But we shall see what's happening after that. Maybe we'll get back into Fargo right away. But there is a monumental anniversary. And there is going to be a cinematic uh, special occasion. So we're still sorting that out. But we have a couple weeks to figure out what we're going to do. So stay tuned and we'll find out. Yes, we will. Uh, so that's it. That's all. That's everything. Thank you so much to everyone who has been here. From the Phantom Organist to Tim's Talk, DJ Play Nice, of course, Lemon Pie. Our benefactor, Eugene Bird. Thank you, Herc130. Appreciate your presence. Uh, and uh, that's, I think that's everybody. Oh, uh, w once again, don't forget to subscribe to Friends of the Channel, uh, Positive Fandom, uh, Anti Derivative Jill, uh, Cinema Gulp. Uh, anybody else? Tim's Talk. Tim's Talk. He's got a bitchin' channel. Uh, and I'm sure he has something to say about the Tales of the Empire. But thank you for being here, uh, and uh, I'm I'm going to be here next week. Uh, are you going to be here next week, Kat? Well, yeah, we will be doing Event Horizon. You, um, oh, right. I thought you were, well, I can't tell. You keep mentioning different things, so I had to make sure. <laughs> do you want to do it again, or do you just want to say the catchphrase? <laughs> you betcha, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>